even though I'm giving it, it's really a collaboration between scientists from different institutes, our collaborators in Mexico, a scientist in Woods Hole, other labs at UC Santa Cruz, and of course my students who actually do all of the work themselves. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, or the outline for my talk, would be to explain what is ocean acidification. When we say ocean acidification, what do we mean by that? How does it work? Why do we care about ocean acidification? Or why should we care about ocean acidification? And describe some research direction, not only from my lab, but generally in the sciences. And finally, share with you some specific results from my lab and discuss where that leads us and what should we do about it. So when we talk about ocean acidification, it's also referred to as the other CO2 pro problem. Do you know what the first CO2 problem is we're having? Global warming, yeah, exactly. And what you see here on this figure is called the Keeling Curve, which shows you the concentration of CO2, carbon dioxide, in the atmosphere over time, collected at Mauna Loa in Hawaii. You can see that it has been increasing. And as a result of the CO2 increase in the atmosphere, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, we have temperature increases, sea level increases, and other changes, perturbations to the uh, climate. Now I want to emphasize that down here, it's very small, but you don't really need to see the details, that we did have changes in CO atmospheric CO2 in the past, in the geological history. What is really unique about the last 50, 100 years is the rate of change. You can see here, Changes have been going up and down for over thousands and hundreds of thousands of years, and that's where we are today. So today, this high hasn't been recorded for at least a million years, maybe more, and the rate of change, this very, very, very sharp slope, is not seen anywhere in the record. So this is something very unique, and what we are interested in is how well that impact us as people living on this planet and other organisms, other uh, creatures that live around us and that we depend on. Now this figure here takes us to how the ocean and this atmospheric CO2 are connected. So this purple line over here is the same graph, this line that we've seen here, smoothed, you can see it over here, that's the Mauna Loa record. But we know exactly how much fossil fuel we're burning because people trade and buy and sell um, oil barrels. <coughs> so we know what should be the atmospheric CO2 had all the fossil fuel we're using is been accumulating in the atmosphere. And that's that blue line, that's the fossil fuel curve. And you can see that there is a difference so the question is, where is all of this 30% difference between what should be there or should have been there to what we actually measure is gone? And a large fraction of it is gone into the ocean. And that is what's causing ocean acidification. If we look at, oh, there is a small video here, there it is. Animation. So this is really a demonstration of what happens with ocean acidification. This carbon dioxide, this carbon dioxide dissolved into seawater. This dissolved CO2 reacts with the water in seawater, forms acid, which then dissociates into bicarbonate, which reacts with the uh, pro releases protons. And then the end result is protons react with carbonate ions, and then we have increase in this acid, carbonic acid, increase in bicarbonate, increase, large increase in acidity, and a decrease in carbonate ion concentrations. Now that there is several changes here, A, changes in acidity, but even 
to some degree more important, there's changes in carbonate ion concentration. And why do we care about carbonate ion concentration? It's because carbonate forms shells of many organisms. But before we talk about the shells of organisms, I want to show you here that this is not any debatable observation. There's very, very hard scientific evidence that this acidification or this input of CO2 from the atmosphere into the ocean is actually happening. It's seen in all of these red and green areas here to a depth of about 1,500 meters in the ocean. You can track this CO2. You can see it based on the isotopes of the, of the carbon dioxide, the concentration, and so on. So it's all over the place. You can see over here, this is again the CO2 change in the atmosphere. The CO2 dissolved in seawater is tracking it very nicely, and the pH is dropping in parallel. So there's lots of direct measurements and evidence. It's not a, well, we're not sure, we don't know. It's happening. And the question is, what are the consequences of that? And it's happening everywhere, everywhere but not at the, to the same extent or at the same rate. This figure over here shows the change that has occurred in surface ocean pH from, 19, from the 1700s to 1990, where zero is no change, and all of these other colors show reduction in ocean pH. And you can see that there isn't a single white spot over here because everything has been impacted. And to, at the higher latitudes, more so than in the low latitudes, because the water there, waters at the high latitudes are cold, and therefore CO2 dissolves more in cold water. If we use this data and our observations in models, we can predict what will be the pH of the ocean with time. So this is w the pH of the ocean in 1875. You can see it's all pretty much blue, which is between 8.2 and 8.4. In 1995, it's about 8.1, 8.2 all over the place. 2050, we're starting to be between eight and below eight all over. And if we go to the 100 years from now, or about 100 years from now, all of the ocean will be below 7.8, 7.9. Now, those of you who are familiar with pH units, you think, well, eight, 0.4 to 7.9, that's not a big change. It's point something pH unit. But keep in mind that pH is measured on a logarithmic scale. So a change of 0.1 or 0.2 pH units is 50% change in acidity in the ocean. So that's huge. That's really a big change. So what are the potential impacts to marine organisms and ecosystems? And I'm saying potential because we don't actually know what they are. This is something that is a hot area of studies and a lot of people are engaged in research to try and figure that out. So it could definitely, or we expect that it will have impact on calcification or the calcium carbonate shells of organisms. There would be shifts in species abundance and distribution, shifts in elements and nutrient concentration, in phytoplankton diversity, and that's the base of the food chain, so it can have cascading impacts to the whole food chain. It, grow, it will impact growth rate, reproduction, lifespan, reduce tolerance of organisms to other perturbations, and so on, including effects on sounds of absorption and other aspects. So there is potentially a lot of issues that we need to consider and think about. And the question is, what do we do about it as scientists? And because this is such a broad problem that we're facing, actually all of the various agencies both in the US and internationally, 
decided that it has there has to be some kind of organized planned research to try to address these issues and they suggested that there should be a fully integrated program of laboratory uh, mesocosms, field monitoring, modeling, as well as communication with policy makers and education in order to understand what the impacts of ocean acidification will be. And the ways to do it is by monitoring the trends, working on the physiological responses of both individual organisms and ecosystems, modeling the change in the responses, and developing both adaptation strategies so we can deal with that. It's happening and really we can't go back. It's not that we can prevent the ocean acidi acidification that is happening. The CO2 in the atmosphere will equilibrate with the water and even if we stop burning fossil fuel today, pH in the ocean will decrease. So it's happening and the, we better get used to it and find ways to adapt to it and do something about it. And obviously we need to communicate this to the general public and that's hopefully what I'm doing today, explaining what this is and what we can do about it. And as I said, it's a very active field of research. What you can see here is the number of published papers per year. And you can see that from the, until 1990, there was very, very few papers published about ocean acidification every year. And all of a sudden, there is this really hockey stick figure for publications in ocean acidification as a response to the funding agencies and the government um, encouragement to do research in this field. In terms of what we do at UC Santa Cruz, there's quite a few labs that are engaged or do ocean acidification research. Um, in RAPES lab, they monitor pH continuously and PCO2 by deploying the sensor right at the Santa Cruz Pier so they can see the variability of pH in the coastal ocean. Um, in the biology department, as part of a collaboration of scientists all the way from Washington, Oregon, Santa Cruz, and down to Sa San Diego. They have a program called Omegas where they're monitoring close to shore and offshore uh, pH and acidification, and specifically they're comparing key species that are uh, important for the California coast along this gradient from north to south. There is work on ecosystem responses that Don Potts and his students and some of my students are engaged, engaged in. And then there is a whole group of students in my lab and in Jim Zappos' lab that are trying to reconstruct pH in the past in the geological record so we can understand how, in, how organisms adapted in the past or what was the natural variability in the past to kind of understand or figure out if what we're facing for the future is different or unique. Um, so what I'm going to share with you today is one project that is part of this whole array of research and that's looking at the impact of ocean acidification specifically on calcification. And as I said, one of the consequences of uh, ocean acidification in addition to this reduced pH, and I just want to make it clear when I say ocean acidification, the ocean itself is not becoming acidic in terms of acid. It, the pH is not going to be less than 7. 7 is neutral pH. But the trend is towards lower pH. So the, when we say acidification, it's not like we're going to touch the ocean and get burned like in acid. That's not going to happen. But these changes in pH are significant for organisms. So if you remember when we looked at what happens in the ocean, in addition to the lower pH and acidification, what's going to happen is this carbonate ion concentrations 
are going to become lower. And this is showing you here the change in carbonate ion concentrations. Again, the white is no change, and this yellow area is minus 25 of minus 40 millimoles per meter cube. So that's a unit by which we measure concentrations of ions in the ocean. You can see all the ocean loses carbonate ion. And we care about it because this carbonate ion is the key ingredient for organisms <coughs> that have shells to form their shells, the carbonate shells. And these include a whole array of organisms from different phyla, from different groups, coralline algae, sponges, corals, bryozoans, all sorts of crustaceans, clams, and so on, occupying a broad array of different niches, different uh, places on the food chain, including uh, organisms that are important for food and fisheries and so on, and as well as um, phytoplankton that are at the base of the food chain and therefore may impact fisheries that we depend on. Now specifically, one of the most prominent organisms that is important for people in terms of A, its beauty, B, being a important ecosystem for coastal communities because of tourism are coral reefs. And the coral reefs are have all of these skeletons made of calcium carbonate or specifically aragonite, which is really very susceptible or very soluble in low pH. Also, the corals themselves are actually very, uh, they're like a sap. So they have a very, oops, wrong direction. They have a very skin tissue layer and therefore they're interacting with the water readily. So there, any change in the water that they're bathing will impact their physiology and particularly their ability to form the coral reefs. And if you look over here, these black dots are the all black areas in the ocean are places where today we have coral reefs and then these colors represent the degree of saturation with respect to calcium carbonate which is another way of measuring how much carbonate ions are there and you can see that all of the red stuff over here which is in 1765 the saturation levels were around 4.5 to 5, and that's the optimal range for corals to calcify. As carbonate ion concentrations or carbonate saturation decreases in 1995, you see that this red zone has decreased, and in 2040 it will decrease any, even more. By 2100, there's not going to be any red or yellow zones which are the optimal and adequate saturation levels for coral calcification, and we're all going to be in marginal to low or extremely low conditions for corals to grow, and including all of this area where we have all of our coral reefs. So that's something we need to think about and worry about. Now, these are model results based on expected uh, ocean acidification, predicted ocean acidification, and the response of corals based mostly on lab experiments. So obviously this has triggered a lot of media news with headlines like increasing acidification is eroding coral reefs, uh, acidification may kill corals, coral prices, and so on because of these predictions. Now the question is, are these predictions, when we take them outside the lab and into the ocean, are going to be valid? And are there any chances that corals might acclimate or adapt to these conditions? What corals and species will respond to this acidification in to what degree? So there's still a lot of questions we want or we need to figure out 
Um, again, that's kind of the same thing that I talked about. You can see that all of the oceans will be impacted, and the question is, what are the corals in the fields, and will will happen? So, a lot of people went ahead and started doing research to figure that out. One of the nice uh, papers that were published took corals from the Red Sea and they grew them in seawater, flowing seawater, where they, ma they manipulated the CO2 concentrations in that water and therefore the pH and let the corals grow. And what happened is this was the corals that they started with and after two, three weeks of being exposed to that water, all of the corals became naked polyps. They became like sea anemones instead of corals. So the corals themselves did not die. In fact, they grew pretty well, but they didn't calcify. So they had no coral reefs. Is the that reefs. A bad thing? Hmm? Is that a bad thing? That's a good question. Well, it's a good thing for the corals, but it's a bad thing for people who depend on coral reefs to protect the beaches, to places where we dive and see the diversity of, ecosystem, of the ecosystem, all the fish nurseries and so on. So the coral reefs themselves is a unique ecosystem and the corals as a species, if it's not building the reef, may also be more vulnerable to predation, diseases and other stuff. Back there, yeah. In over here, they actually the the pH they went for is mimicking the p the lowest pH we predict, which will be in 2100. So it was 7.8, something like that. But it was, I mean, th this paper is particularly interesting because it solves one of the paradoxes we had in the science because we know that over the geological record coral reefs based on fossils persisted, but then there were interruptions in time. So there were corals growing and then they disappeared from the record and after a million years or half a million years, we see again fossils of the same coral or very similar coral species. So it's very hard to imagine that they will just evolve again out of nowhere to be in the same species. But this might explain it because maybe either they were, you know, a, a little, there were some oases where they got preserved or they just did not fossilize because they didn't have any carbonate skeletons and therefore they disappear from the record. But as soon as conditions change, they start calcifying. So did anybody change the pH to see what happens to these guys? Back? Back. No, they didn't. But that's a good question and good, interesting thing to do. Mm -hmm. And do they become solitary? It looks like they're separated. Yeah, well, the polyps themselves for corals are individual uh, polyps. They grow as a colony because they share this reef structure where each po where the polyps live together in a big coral head. But each polyp is a separate individual. So, when similarly in lab experiments, uh, people grew corals in today's conditions, 2050, and very, very high, and you can see that uh, image of their skeleton, and it just dissolves away. It disappears. <laughs> they can't calcify as rapidly. And it looks like the response is not just linear. They're doing okay until about the saturation gets to 2.5, and then after that, bang, there is a drop. And it doesn't matter if, it, if the conditions are changed because we're adding acid or because we're adding CO2. It's the carbonate ion concentration that is causing this. And people looked at the same thing in the field where they took these mesocosms, isolated a patch of coral and pumped CO2 and got similar results. And in general, if we try to look at that um, in terms of different studies, you can see 
that there is a decrease in the calcification that depends on this aragonite saturation. But when people started doing more studies with different species of coral, they found out that that's not always the case. For example, in this study here, you can see this is normal CO2, this is high CO2, and at 25 degrees, there's no difference. High or low, the corals are doing just fine. But if you increase the temperature, then you can see a big drop. So that's another complication where there are multiple things happening at the same time that may have an impact on these corals. So we can't look at one parameter in isolation from the rest. And also, obviously, different corals seem to be doing different things. So they're not, not all corals are created equal in that respect. Again, looking at past records of calcification, when we look down at the extension rate or the growth rate versus aragonite saturation, you can see a drop in one study. And then in another study, you see fluctuations ups and downs, ups and downs, but if you look at it, there isn't a trend that shows a sharp decrease in the present. So again, different studies show different things depending on the location, depending on the conditions, and so on. What, what was the uh, scale of years there? 1700 to 2000. <laughs> so. One of the key questions based on all of these uh, results is what do we know or what can we say about the potential of corals to acclimate or adapt and maybe still be able to calcify even when the ocean pH and PCO2 is, uh, when ocean pH is decreasing and the carbonate saturation is decreasing and Specifically, if we protect these coral reefs, if we maintain them healthy, we don't go uh, overfishing there and dumping uh, sewage into the reefs, would they still be able to maintain their calcification despite what's going to happen with the ocean pH? Because if not, we have to figure out what can we do if we want to save them, maybe put them on land in aquariums or whatever. So it's different solutions depending on what happens in nature. So in order to look at corals, yes? Um, back to your time frames, um, we see stuff in 1700, 1750. Who were these people collecting this information back then? So That's pretty uh, intricate <laughs> stuff. Yes, <laughs> a lot of this is uh, reconstructed from coral cores. So corals okay. grow for hundreds of years. You drill a core, you count the annual layers like a tree ring, and then you can look at the chemistry or the distance between these layers and you can reconstruct calcification rate from that. So um, some studies have been done in natural laboratories where you go to places where naturally, for whatever reasons, you have low pH waters. This study is, oops, sorry. This study over here was done in Papua New Guinea. Um, at Papua New Guinea, it's very volcanically active area, so there is submarine CO2 springs over there, and CO2 is, will interact with water to form acidic acid, so therefore it's a natural <coughs> low pH environment. And what they found, you can see here, this is a pH 8.1, and this is when it's less than 7.7. .7. The ecosystem looks very, very different. You can see the bubbles here are the gases that are spewing from the, the ground under the water. These are CO2 vents. So they found that a lot of the processes are negatively impacted. So this line over here at 1.0 is there's no change. If it's higher numbers, is that a positive or an increase? Lower number is a decrease. So a lot of these things like coral cover and a hard coral cover, coral richness, structure of corals, and so on, 
sponges, coralline algae are all seem to be negatively impacted. But if you look over here, of course, seagrass, percent less CO2 and other renewable sources and so on. And based on these scenarios, they predict how much CO2 will be in the atmosphere. And these models have been around for a long time. And then based on that, they can use this concentration to determine the solubility of CO2 in seawater based on sea surface temperature primarily. That's the major variable. And based on that, then they can predict the carbonate ion. Uh, so most of, for this time scale, most of the, except for one model, they all kind of give very, very similar results. Uh, how will the changes in pH affect uh, krill and other heat houses? So actually, Helen, who's a student in Don Potts' lab is doing exactly what you're asking, trying to figure out if and how it will impact krill, uh, and that's important because they're food for whales and other big fish, and so far what we're seeing is that they're not very heavily impacted at all, and one of the reasons potentially is that they actually, the krill migrate up and down in the water column and deep, deeper water have lower pH naturally. So they're used to or they're exposed to this natural pH level, low pH levels anyway, so they're not as sensitive. What about phytoplankton? I'm sorry to yell out. What about phytoplankton that have calcified? So phytoplankton, again, some phytoplankton will actually benefit from high CO2 because CO2 is what they use for photosynthesis. So that's not going to be bad for them. Now other phytoplankton have calcium carbonate shells like yeah. coccolithophores and for them it turns out yeah. that some it depends on the balance of how much CO2 so they're initially they're going to be happy but then at a certain level they'll reach a tipping point and they'll start being negatively impacted. So again, depending on the specific species, the rate of change and so on. Now, the, in contrast to corals, some of these phytoplankton multiply or their life, half-life is very fast. So they have a higher potential to adapt and acclimate than slow-growing organisms. So if you, you can have them grow, you know, two generations a day, then they can maybe deal with it better. Christy. So I have a question for the audience. Did anyone bubble long enough to see a oh, change yeah. in the cup? Did, you Did any of the colors change? Kelly, <laughs> <laughs> can I see you? Hold it up. <laughs> yeah, this one changed. It's changed from blue to yellow. So <laughs> CO2 changed the pH of the seawater over here. <laughs> there are indicators that are more sensitive, so you can do it with just three, four blows. <laughs> and the other, the other thing I have here, if anybody wants to come or we can move it around, is some a dilute acid and some corals. And if you drop a few drops of acid on the corals, you can see little bubbles and fumes showing how acid can dissolve corals different types of corals as well as various shells of organisms. If anybody wants to come play with that, they're welcome. Yes, question there. We already talked about the rising sea levels and the like melting of polar ice caps. How does that affect? Does that accelerate the process or does it act as a buffer to slow it, it down? It's independent. It Both of the both ocean acidification and sea level <coughs> rise and melting of the ice caps in the polar ocean are all phenomena or all results of increasing atmospheric CO2. The atmospheric CO2 because of fossil fuel burning and other activities, anthropogenic activities, results in a melting of ice which increases sea level, increasing of 
ocean temperature which increases sea level the sea surface temperature increases also melts the ice uh, there's feedback mechanisms there where you're increasing temperature, there is more greenhouse gases forming in wetlands that are accelerating or even having more impact on that. And then in addition to all of this, you're also dissolving the CO2 in seawater and that causes the acidification. But the amount of water that is added to the ocean from the melting waters or ice caps is not enough to change the ocean acidification in any direction. In fact, if anything, these um, water is fresh water because it's not the sea icebergs that are sea ice that are causing the change in sea level. It's only land-based ice that will impact sea level change. Land like something that's on land that's being added to the ocean because the sea the sea ice is already there so if it, whether it's in ice form or fluid form doesn't make any difference to sea level yes were any of the corals that survived in the springs branching corals um, yes there were a few branching corals but mostly uh, not br non branching now we did transplant a branching coral from outside the reef into the reef and it did just fine. Okay, well if that's all, enjoy the rest of your meal. Thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight, especially after the change in plans. Um, our next Science on Tap next month is December 18th um, with Eshwar Ramanan from Chemistry talking about viruses. And that'll be December 18th, exactly one week before Christmas. And then our next two are on earthquakes and how religions are responding to climate change. Lots of cool stuff coming up. Um, and if you are not on the Science on Tap mailing list, but you would like to be, um, come on up and talk to our wise president, Kim. She's got a little tablet so you can find, type in your email right there. <laughs> and I'm sure Adina will still be around if you want to ask a few questions. Appreciate Adina hanging around. She has to drive back over the hill now. Yeah, high school yeah. students so they can show their teachers they've been in a science school. <laughs> 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 <laughs>